like to welcome you all to the uh, 79th Forest Industry Lecture and hope that you've all thoroughly enjoyed the poster session, which is always a part of our spring session that we have. Before we be begin, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, the University of Alberta acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respects the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant communities. Next, I'd like you to take a peek at your programs and see that we have a, a full afternoon for you here. And inside the program, there's um, a slight history about the Phil's lectures that's being put together by Peter Murphy, who I know I saw him come in. Peter, you're here hiding at the back over there. Uh, there's also, of course, the bio and abstract for today's speaker. And next, I would like to move on and acknowledge all of our sponsors who make this possible. It's a wonderful group of sponsors, and we so much appreciate the funds that come forward to allow us to put this event on. Just to run through the names quickly, Alberta Agriculture and Forestry, Alberta Forest Products Association, Alberta Innovates, Alberta Pacific Forest Industries, Altus Group, ANC Timber, Association of Alberta Forest Management Professionals, CANFOR, Canadian Institute of Forestry, Con E. Dermot Environmental and Forestry Services, DLA Piper, Earth Econ, Four Core Solutions, Forest Economic Advisors, he was a previous speaker, and after he spoke, he decided to sponsor the lecture series, so we always bring a student from Reese. Uh, Forest Soil Science, FP Innovations, FRI Research, FY Forest, Genome Alberta, Greenlink Forestry, Incremental Forest Technologies, Miller Western Forest Products, MNP, LLP, Natural Resources Canada, Division of Canadian Forest Service, Northern Forestry Centre, Norboard, Philip Robert Enterprises, PwC Canada, Silvicon Limited, Toco Industries, Vanderwell Contractors, West Fraser Mills, Warehouser Edmonton, Wild and Pine, and Woodland Operations Learning Foundation. I'd like you all to join me in thanking our sponsors for this speaker series. I should have probably started by introducing myself, because I always think of that halfway through. I'm Barb Thomas. I'm uh, the Phil's academic lead and an associate professor in the Department of Renewable Resources. So with, with my own introduction, I'd now like to introduce the head of our department. Ellen McDonald, uh, who's going to give us a bit of an update on what's going on in the department and the faculty, and then we'll follow by introducing our guest speaker this afternoon. Ellen. Okay, thanks, Barb, and uh, thanks everyone for coming. It's great to see such a uh, good turnout. It's always exciting, Phil's Day, and this is a very, very uh, special event in our department that happens twice a year, and uh, we're very glad to see you here. Um, I'm Ellen McDonald. I'm the chair of the Department of Renewable Resources. Um, I, I was trying to think of updates since last November, but it's like a blur from last November till now. I don't know if it's like that for you. Uh, we, we were quite busy in the fall doing some hiring, and um, I can now confirm we have uh, uh, two new uh, assistant professors in the department, Brad Pino and Carol Frost. I'm not sure if they're here or not. They could put their hands up. Probably there. Oh, yeah, Brad's here. <laughs> uh, they both started in January. Brad's a silviculture professor and Carol's a conservation biology professor. And then we've hired another new assistant professor in uh, ecosystem-based management that uh, will be applying for an industrial research chair. That's Dr. Charles Nock, and he'll be starting this summer, joining us this summer. Um, 
other than that, I just I, maybe I would just comment that I've just emerged from faculty evaluation committee, which is the process once a year where we evaluate all the professors in the department. And I just have to say we have the most amazing group of professors in our department. I'm so proud to be able to represent them in that process. And they're just working so hard and doing so many amazing things and, uh, you know, doing great research, great teaching, and also connecting to the community. Many, many people putting a lot of effort to make sure that their science uh, hits the road as you speak uh, in terms of seeing application and uh, engagement with uh, partners, government and industry partners. So that's something that I find really gratifying. Um, anyways, it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker. Um, uh, I'm very happy that Dr. Joris van Acker uh, agreed to join us as our special invited speaker for this 79th Forest Industry Lecture. Uh, Dr. Van Acker earned his master's in forestry and a PhD in wood science at Ghent, Ghent University. He's teaching me how to say it properly. <laughs> Ghent University in Belgium. And after that, he went to work in industry for a while in a veneer plywood mill that worked with uh, poplars and beech, he told me. And then he rejoined the university, Ghent University. And there he is now a professor and he's head of uh, a group, uh, the Laboratory for Wood Technology. His research group is also part of the Center for X-ray Tomography, and in that work he focuses on examining the nanoscale structure of wood samples and looking at relationships between wood structure and use for different wood products. Finally, he's the president of the International Research Group on Wood Protection, which some of the industry people here may know about already or might be interested in becoming involved in. This is a group of industry and academics interested in wood science and wood protection. They hold a conference every year, and it's at different places around the world, and it's going to be in Quebec in 2019. 2019 in Quebec, so if you're interested in learning more about that, I think he's going to mention something. Maybe we'll see a website and maybe you'd like to go. He's offered, authored over 100 publications in refereed journals and many of those have focused on wood properties and wood protection. And I'm very much looking forward to his talk today, so please join me in welcoming him. Oh, it's going to work. It's going to work? Like that. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction. I should be careful with this one. Uh, good afternoon, and first of all, I want to say this uh, great pleasure for me to be over here. It's my first time in Edmonton, uh, not my first time in Canada, but uh, definitely I enjoyed my stay up to now. I have been treated very well. Thank you very much for hosting me this way, and I'm also looking forward to interacting with you a little bit, especially in the question and answers round after my talk. Hopefully, I'm not taking too long, and I want to apologize that I'm not native English speaking, so if there's some words with a twist of French or something else, don't worry about it, it's because I'm European. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm here to talk about poplar, a fast-growing wood resource, and somewhat a question, are we maximizing its use? I do probably will present it in a way that you not fully expecting it. You might think he's going to talk about genetics, about hybrid poplars, about breeding, about selection. None of that. I'm a wood technologist, so I'm going to introduce you on what is the maximizing of its use. And that's my most focused at the end of my talk. I myself am um, coming from the Ghent University. This should work. I'm showing. Uh, that I'm working at a wood lab. Thank you for the introduction. And I want to uh, welcome you also to visit my country and my town. Uh, we only have a quarter of a million of inhabitants, but we have over 70,000 students, which is lovely to get interacting with students from over here. But we have somewhat called 650 different cafes with some more than 1,000 different beers and 475 different restaurants. Okay, this is um, also a city which is called the Manhattan of the Middle Ages because of the huge, well, huge, I should never use the word huge in North America, but um, higher towers and, and things like that. Um, related to what my lab is doing, they're doing a lot of different things because I'm actually running a group, a research group on wood science and technology, which is actually the 
only one academic group in Flanders, in the northern part of Belgium. So I had to cover with the team as much as possible all the different items related to wood. But we're specializing on two major things. One is referred to uh, X-ray tomography, where we're looking in the nanostructure. So we have a dedicated uh, CT scanner, which we use for looking into the microstructure of wood, sometimes related to the forestry aspect, sometimes related to the final products. And we do a lot also on moisture dynamics, on, on interaction of materials with moisture, uh, whether it is heading towards deterioration by fungi or something like that. It's one of our major assets. In this case, you see a picture on the right side, which is depicting different plywoods from all over the world, but mainly related to the European uh, market, of course. And of course, I should also say we were last year 200 years, which is nice for us to say. Yeah, OK. Uh, what about poplar? I mean, when I say the word poplar, I understood from my last days over here that many people immediately think about hybrid poplar. When we talk about poplar, we're talking about poplar. We're talking also about aspen, which is the same stuff for us. It's not exactly the same stuff. And we might even include willows, all differences of salica sage, which actually in wood science would be grouped as a whole package. I'm not saying it is on the forestry or on the silviculture side the same thing, but on the kind of using this material, they might have major similarities. So we actually sometimes focusing in Europe on hybrids, clones, planted forests, pioneer trees, something like that. And in an international context, I'm acting with this uh, expertise, I would say, with this interaction in the network, which is on the FAO, on the UN na 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 established level, called the International Poplar Commission. And I'm responsible for the sustainable livelihoods, land use products, and bioenergy. Responsible is a big word. I'm actually doing a job over there. Um, but um, actually, in, in the resume you received, there was something on the word pro populus, means um, something in favor of using poplar. And populus is the tree of the people, and so they could have different meanings like that. But it's actually a European Poplars Association, and actually on Monday we'll have a meeting, which is grouping like the industry related to poplar. So I will try to focus also on these aspects of what is the European industry thinking about the forest industry or the poplar using industry thinking about their future. On the other hand, I will also be involved, and I was uh, twisted my arm to participate also in the wooded, <laughs> woody crops in uh, Rhinelander in, in Wisconsin in U.S. mid this year. And later this year, I kindly invite everybody, but not everybody will go, I'm sure about that, to Argentina, where we have an uh, international poplar symposium, which is the seventh already in a row, and I'm also somewhat involved in that one. Uh, it's, it's some of the events. It's actually alternating with events uh, which is on a four-year basis from the International Poplar Commission. So there's actually a lot of networking in this poplar, but take it for a wide range from aspen, willows, all this stuff, uh, but going not only on the use of the material, definitely not, but a lot on other aspects also related to it. So in my first part, I will stick a little bit to the first part of my title of the talk, is uh, the wood resource, so looking for new solutions for the forest-based sector in socio-economic context. I want to bring it in a context first before starting to say why do we need fast-growing poplar trees, why do we might use them in certain circumstances. So yes, we have some potential of the forest production, and there are some limitations. I will probably discuss it a little bit more, but there's probably a maximum of what we can produce on Earth on forest biomass. It's not like with metals or concrete, we can say we increase with 50% next year, that's easy done. It's not just like that. Uh, we have sustainable supply of resources for our future, which is one of the things. We consider timber production today as an excellent ecosystem service, but only as one of them. Um, we in Europe, but also over here, I think, tend to, especially in this Alberta region, balance energy and material use and all factors related to that. Um, we have been discussing a lot and we're still ongoing discussing on how to substitute man-made building or materials in general. We're looking for having more renewable material in that green building is called. We do think that wood and even poplar might have a surface light that is considerable, that is sufficient, that is adequate, fit for purpose for many applications. And we're working a lot on innovation related to that. Um, but we have an integration and flexibility of a multi-purpose forest management, or whatever you call it, where not only wood production is part of the story. 
but you're talking about poplars, hybrid poplars, then it's all about wood production, isn't it? No, not at all, but anyhow it's hard. This maximum potential, is this something we have restrictions on? Yes. Um, it is available from forest. Um, I put between brackets, I'm a European guy, I put see me, see my even between brackets, natural forest. Uh, we don't have actually a lot of this kind of stuff, you have a lot more. Uh, but we have a multifunctional management of that, and that has some restrictions on using it as a whole, um, biomass for our use today. We want to have it sustainable for the future. Next to that, or integrated with it, we have planted forests, which is a new name actually for plantations, uh, where poplar might be one of, next to eucalypts, next to other systems, mechanisms of producing more wood over time uh, over the next future. But we also have, and, and that's probably a little bit more European thinking than it's North American, we could introduce also some arable land or even farming uh, related uh, timber production, salt rotation coppice, agroforestry, as one of the mechanisms to produce more woody biomass in the future. Over the whole world, and, and this is trends that are definitely present in Europe, we are thinking about more ecosystem services. Some of the trees in my country, especially in Belgium, we're not talking about wood production, we're talking about all different other ecosystem services, like protecting against fine dust and these fine particles. All these elements are very critical today. We also have trends that after a period of introducing more softwood species in our forests in Europe, that we want to go back to more hardwoods, which was the original constitution of many of the forests in our area, which will be inevitably a decrease in production. Also more and more forests, and as in several decades, are no longer used for wood production. For different reasons, we exclude them. We take them as a reserve, as a special origin. And this also makes that our potential of increasing the amount of wood for the future is not just simple. So we have to have different stories, different thinking about it. Um, I just give you a few slides which are taken from the United Nations Economic uh, Environmental on the FAO, Forest Structure Annual Market Review, which is on an annual basis. I've taken the, one, the last ones that are really fully published. Um, we all probably are aware that paper and paperboard is stabilized over the last country, uh, centuries. Uh, what's your saying? Days? No? Years? Okay, good. Get that back. Yes, got your attention. Um, it's fully awareness that pulp and paper is probably not a full brand new future for us. It's something that might decline over the years. It's definitely something that uh, depending on different countries, and you see Europe, North America, and the regions uh, with Russia, um, there's not a potential of a major increase. So no worry, we'll be stabilized. What I do see, and probably for some of you that might be um, critical, new, you know something about cross-laminated timber, and you know something about Dach countries, so it means that Germany, Austria, Switzerland are producing something like half a million um, cubic meters of this new product for construction, and that's increasing. It's a balance. Another thing is that I want to, and that might be valid especially for this region, um, Europe is using more and more biomass for energy, and we have been increasing that gradually over the years to have a part of our energy production uh, based on biomass. And uh, our import to get that done is increasing. And on your right part, you would see that we are, in to some extent, using your country as a resource for that, which is an important element in do we need more of this energy? Do we need? Uh, do we want more? Do we want to use it like that? All this together means that uh, on the wood availability aspect, we might have issues in the coming years. And uh, uh, colleague professors have said that you called, call it the perfect storm by 2030. That means that we will have major uh, discussions. I'm not saying a war on what is the resource and who is going to use it in Europe. Okay. We are thinking about having a sustainable forest wood industry chain um, with ecosystem forest management, good governance. Um, but we also see, and I would def definitely work networking, and I worked on a project related to that, that the interaction between forestry, the people producing trees and wood, 
and the people in the industry has been less and less over the last years. And we see little knowledge or less knowledge in the forest management society, I would call, on how wood is used. And we see less knowledge from the side, from the forest industries, on actually how forest is grown today. But still, we want to have this kind of ecological approach. So biodiversity should increase. We should have more scrubland. We should have more open areas in our forest. We should go close to nature. And we are sometimes very much critical on even age tree farming. Right. Should go. OK. Just all to bring you to this question. At this moment, we are on 3.5 billion cubic meters of wood used in the world. Some say we might go to 10 and over 10 billion cubic meters by 2050. Why? One of the things is that we might all, in overall the world, might have a standard of living that is improving, probably not for me, but for some other people at least. Um, there will still be more people on Earth than today. And this will bring us to at least one parameter. I mean, if it's today consuming 0.6 cubic meters per wood per person per year, we definitely will increase. I will show you some figures on that. And the population will surely go to somewhere close to this 11 billion by 2100, according to the United Nations. And on the other hand, I'm very much promoting as a wood technologist a sustainable use of resources, uh, promoting the fact that wood, timber, and these all derived products are renewables. We should actually look and build our society on this kind of materials more than even today. So we use more wood per person. The next slide gives you some US figures on the, I call it, call it 70 cubic feet or two cubic meters per person per year, which is a lot higher of the open six, isn't it? And the right one, I already explained that we are going to be a bit more. If I put this all together in the equation, today we will, if this all comes to reality, Earth will be not big enough for producing this. So we have to come up with some answers. So this might be that we not only have to use the forest as it is now, but probably we'll have to do some production of renewables specifically to come up with good stories for this. So yes, we have the worldwide context where we use renewables, where we have material that has a lot of embodied and embedded energy. Uh, there's a carbon impact, sequestration systems. Uh, there's a lot of forest certification, how to do that, how to deal with that. There are good examples of uh, fast growing trees that are getting certified and getting in this sector. Um, new things come popping up, especially I was confronted quite heavily with the fact that wood is good for health, but also forests are good for health. Um, yeah, there are people talking about uh, smart habitats for elderly people and using wood for that. And that's now becoming big stories in Europe. So these things are happening. On the other hand, we do see the biorefinery, the industry uh, producing some components from wood and, and actually biotechnology at the same time to trying to use other materials than petrochemistry. And we should probably substitute man-made materials like plastics and metals and concrete in the future. Big story to start from and to get the supply. And where can we get it from? We can get it from different type of forest. And it is not, I mean, this, everybody's um, juggling around with how you define a forest, how you define a plantation. According to some of my colleagues in, at FAO, um, this might be a good way of defining it. So we, from the left side, got this primary forest, where we, pristine forest in the tropics sometimes, but also some other ones where we might not have a lot of potential to get more out of it without destroying some of the systems. So we might not over-exaggerate the potential of having more production over there. And then going to the right side, we have also trees outside of the forest, which I explained might be something linked to agriculture, things like that. But actually, the middle component might be the best one, the best option. So it would be, according to Canadian discussion, silviculture and even tree farming as options to get to more wood. I just bring you this story as a What is then, I would call it an eco-techno approach. 
it's technology, but we have to put it into perspective related to production in an environment which is called our ecological systems. We will have to look for the balance between material and energy use. So it might have been that some of you were thinking this person will talk about poplar and wood for bioenergy. I might, but I probably will do also some talk on materials. There's also something like integration of the sector. I mean, many people in wood science, but especially all dedicated, dedicated to forestry and how you sell trees, know that you don't sell a tree for one purpose. You sell it for a multi-purpose and probably an integrated approach like uh, in Scandinavia with us, we have a tree is dedicated for sawmilling, but it's, it's at the same time also dedicated for pulping. And it's not one without the other one. It's always together. In Europe, we are very much in this integrating approach, and we call it cascade use to some extent, where we try to get things again in the cycle and cyclic before, because we don't have a lot of resources. For many materials, we don't want to that. What is difficult today, and it's probably becoming more difficult in the future, is whether we are still considering tree and wood quality as a parameter in the equation for forestry, or whether it's just biomass. And finally, I want also to address the fact that we always have to consider material like poplar as being limited in surface life, limited in use, but today we have methods, and I will show you some of them, uh, to probably increase it to something that is really sufficient for our end use. So about this balance between material and energy use. Um, we do use uh, wood for combustion, firewood pellets, and we buy some from North America in that uh, case to make electricity, green electricity. We're getting into thermomechanic, thermochemical conversion systems, not charcoal only, but also pyrolysis, gasification, also for energy. We're getting more and more storage becoming viable on related to biorefineries and even biochemical processes, producing liquid biofuels, second generation, white chemistry, all these things. Um, this has an impact on the way we will deal with aspen, poplar, willows in the future because definitely these will need resources and we will definitely have to provide some of this material. The question is, this, is this the road to go or do we have to check on other roads? There is also an impact of international trade and subsidy and I referred to it already, uh, the fact that we import quite some biomass from Canada and the US related to uh, substituting fossil fuels and getting a green image. I get an invoice at home on green electricity and I know it is produced or based on pellets from Canada. Good. I'm very pleased with that. Good. Um, but also we see that we spoil wood quality. And probably you say, spoil, yes. I'm working quite a lot with students, uh, PhD students in my group from uh, Central Africa. Right? There's a tradition from Belgians having something to do with that. So um, at Congo, I have still good relationships. And, and they come over and they discuss on the use of firewood. And they're using extremely valuable material just to heat for cooking. And we allow them to do that because we don't give them the alternative. We should probably give them oil and make those wood species valuable with news. Just a question of what we do in the future. Okay, this is not always listening or it is waiting for me. Now it is. Okay, I talked about embodied energy. And, and I'm not sure if my English is sufficient to understand the difference between an embodied and embedded. But at least I want to say that wood is not requiring a lot of energy to be a final product. So you don't need a lot of transportation cost, a lot of processing cost to come to a product. Contrary to things like aluminium, but even other metals and even other things. So that's a good point. In the end, it's also containing energy from the beginning. So if you make some products out of it, when you recover the material at the end and you're no longer to able to put it in the cascade use, you can still burn it and still make energy out of it. So a lot, and even my legislation from my region was the first one to say, you cannot burn virgin fiber. You have to first look for the use of it and then afterwards burn it. It's not always applicable because it's not applicable on import. You get the story? Good. Wood is also very positive on efficient Building, uh, green building is something with green renewable materials, but it's also something about efficiency of energy. And wood has been 
probably in North America it's common to know that, but we have discovered for passive houses, for low energy housing, that the wood is a fantastic construction product. And that's, we're going to need more of it. So if you come to this case of poplar, aspen, willow, where you can decide on different things, and, and even in selection and breeding you should decide on these things. You get poplars and willows for bioenergy, uh, specific clones and cultivation harvesting systems that might be useful for other applications. And when you might think about multipurpose applications, distance of plantations, uh, rotation periods that are different, but all is about combining our needs for the future and deciding on what we're going to produce for our society based on fast-growing trees like poplar. And we can actually build houses out of it, but we can also make pulp, paper, bioenergy. And I'm not saying that was a bad one, but we have to question today which one would be the future option. I'm very much in favor of having multi-purpose options and not having to decide today, but somebody else let's decide tomorrow. <laughs> I'm not a politician, but I'm very close to it. <laughs> Okay, this is about vertical integration and cascade use. I mean, we have been using this, sometimes we're forgetting it. I mean, are there a lot of plywood mills in this region? There are probably, but um, yeah. But uh, yep, north, yeah, yeah, yeah. But do they always consider plywood mills as the first option when you're cutting a tree? Not necessarily. Do you always have to say that, yes, we should have this fantastic part of the tree always up to the highest quality product. We don't do that all the time. We might do that more in the future. So this integration approach and having companies really deciding actually on what to use for what purpose with these elements that I have been talking about. Uh, my government always talks about wood waste because they want taxes on it. It's probably it's over here also like that. There's no waste. We're using residuals. We're using, as I said, pulp uh, based on the sawmill industry. And we recycle since long in this cascade approach. I mean, uh, we will not get uh, extra points in Europe anymore because we're already there. We're already using the residuals and the recovered wood for particle board, for chipboard. And we're using uh, this one major paper mill in Ghent. It's a big one. It's solely recovered material. There's a, a plant production of close to 900,000 cubic meters of chipboard based on 80% of recovered wood. So the Belgian has no forest, or the Flemish has no forest, but they have a wood industry. This is thingers of the future. And in the end, we can still burn it and compost it. So it's fantastic, isn't it? So yeah, I, I used these slides from my friend from Italy, Marco Fioravanti from Florence, and he has this poplar tree, and you can start using that part. Yes? peeling, making plywood, packaging, and I will show you more on that. You can also sew it because it don't need the same quality for it. You can a little bit higher in the tree, and, and you, you're probably all aware, oh, this is quite stupid stuff, this professor is talking. I know all this stuff. Yes, definitely good. Then it's okay, then that's uh, good to do that. So we get to blockboard, get to different elements, which could be from poplar or from other elements, and even components for energy. And finally, you can chip it. And you can put it into pulp, paper, uh, biomass for energy, particle board, fiber board, and it's written here in uh, European English. Uh, um, but have you seen where these arrows are around? He deliberately put the full tree for that purpose. Because the full tree is suitable for that. Only question is whether we're going to use it integrated, we're going to use a part for the high end end use, or we're going to burn it all. So that's a story, and that's a story for the future for our years. So yes, and what is tree quality? What is wood quality? I mean, we appreciate wood in general uh, for aesthetics. Sliced veneer, parquet, music instruments are very good examples. We think that um, mechanics or strength, stiffness are very important. We use timber, engineered wood products, uh, these things. We even think that durability is a very good point. If you use it for exterior applications, in many cases, no issue. We can have sufficient service, do some protection. We get two good stories on that, even sometimes better than man-made products. We have created systems, mechanisms, to not only be restricted to the tree as such, 
but we make huge panels because we do veneer, we do particle board, we do MDF, we do all these products since the mid last century on large scale. And I'm not necessarily fully fun of talking on this one, but we use also chemicals from wood for biopolymers for white chemistry building blocks. So we deteriorate our tree and we come to basic chemical blocks for the plastic industry. Is that possible? We've done it since decades. We can do it more today. Right, and what is then actually our technological assets for that? Beauty. I mean, unfortunately, there's not a lot of wood. Oh, this one is nice, but it's probably not real stuff. But anyhow. Uh, <laughs> But we still recognize it as beauty, isn't it? I mean, it's, it, many of the materials are like that. Um, it's also a multi-level natural composite. I mean, I try to explain that to my students, that the cell wall and the, the cells integrated and the tree as such is actually a fantastic composite, starting with one of the best polymers in the world, cellulose. And combined with lignin, you get to a fantastic material. So it gets, a, in construction, low-bearing, fantastic performance. It's not better than steel, but still, when you have big buildings, they are constructed in wooden beams or glue lamp systems. So it must be something. So this, of course, a fire emitter. The specific strength and stiffness is mentioned. It's interesting and abundant chemistry. I mean, that's what I was talking about. People are talking on fire. Um, many of you might still consider wood as being vulnerable to fire. I mean, you've been using it at home probably to cook or to heat us and stuff like that. But on the other hand, it's now considered with the CLT and this thing as being a material that is very, very good in fire protecting. And uh, after we had some issues with metal-based high-rise buildings, I'm not referring to some different ones, but heat is not a very good element for that, while for wood, it's construction stability very much. And finally, I mean, a fantastic story. It's renewable, isn't it? We can get it again and again and again. OK, when you go to wood, poplar, and you can also, uh, is this um, quality something critical? I mean, many people consider this tree as not high quality, nothing special. Uh, it has been used, and I'm not referring to clock production or something like that in the net, but veneer, plywood, matches. Uh, today we are exploring options for engineered wood products like LVL. Um, we are exploring, you already using it that way, isn't it? Glue lamb, uh, but even timber for construction from poplar as an alternative for softwood. We are, of course, using it for packaging. And long time, people have said food contact is not good with wood. And so they used plastic and all the other stuff. Today, some are referring to back to wood as a good alternative for plastics because they are getting troubles. And is it also important for quality to be assessed for pulp? Yes. For energy? Probably. But probably that's not the one that is mostly relying on tree and wood quality. OK, that was my part one. Now, getting to part two, I said I already don't want to talk on genetics, but I want to talk on wood products. I want to guide you through options that you probably know or if you don't know. If you're from forest industry, you surely will recognize some of it. Um, but I will focus a little bit on engineered wood products and on wood modification as options for poplars, aspen, willows, for all these kind of stuff, which are fast growing. It could actually also be valid for some other species, like eucalypts or other ones. But I'm focusing on poplar because it's my, yeah, and I should have written poplar correct in that one. OK. Engineered wood products. Um, I should not probably have the definition because um, everybody's aware about engineered wood products over here because it's an old American invention, the word. And it's um, uh, yeah, made from lumber, veneers, strands, woods, uh, even fibers could be possible using resins to make something like a lumber like structural product. And we have different abbreviations or things like glue lam, uh, laminated uh, materials, but also cross laminated timber plywood, which is a very known system, but also LVL, which is derived product or similar product with veneers in one direction, laminar strand lumber, parallel strand lumber, uh, eye joist, uh, and wood-based panels in general would also be considered as uh, engineered wood products. And these are different companies. I'm sorry if some of you are not listed and so just taking a grab and it's not the latest symbols all the time, but I want to show you the three top ones, which you definitely don't know. OK? 
Okay, so this Carnica is one of the people that is a production companies in Spain using poplar for plywood, exporting already to the U.S. Panguaneta from Italy doing something similar, and then Latvias Vineres using birch for plywood in uh, in Estonia. But also the other ones, you know. So this industry, and I, you don't have to recall this slide, but you have an impression of who is involved in that. I will show different slides with, all, again, companies, and there will be different ones. Different than these ones involved in wood science and wood technology. They're definitely related to sawn wood. And, and I'm not sure, you use the word lumber or do you use the word timber over here? Lumber, right, and then it's, it's there. But timber is also a word that we sometimes use. And we see that uh, we have a, quite a considerable production of this kind of materials, both coniferous and non-coniferous. And, and uh, Europe and, and North America plays an important role on coniferous, while the non-coniferous ones are a lot related to Asia. And uh, you might expect also Africa play a role in that, but that's unfortunately not true. So materials and that's what that's not. So yes, poplar is well suited to do that, and uh, it's a viable alternative for softwoods. It's in the same density range. It only has some difficulties, and I will talk. With structural timber, that poplar might uh, have some issues on drying, probably knowing about wet pockets, about tension wood, and that mechanical stress grading is not a simple story for hardwoods in general, and for poplar in particular. So that means that when you really want to go to structural uses, you have some disadvantages of hardwoods. But on the other hand, it's still possible. So it has been considered as an alternative for construction timber. And I should say, before we started using a lot of softwoods, we actually used a lot of poplar and similar products for different farmhouses and things like that in the Middle Ages even. So it is possible to do that. So if you were back to where we're using oak and poplar for construction in Europe, we were not using softwoods at that time. So an example from a conference in Lyon in Spain, where they are actually trying to reinvent poplar for construction, or aspen to be, or for furniture, or for something similar. And you might say, OK, this looks strange. I'm not used to it. Consider this fact it's a lightweight product. And contrary to many of the hardwoods we're using in the past, this is easier to be introduced as such on the market because of the different then I come to glue lam and cross-laminated timber, and then showing some of the elements on how to produce it and how to get to this kind of products. Actually, um, how do you say cross-laminated timber can be defined? It's plywood on steroids, isn't it? Something like that. <laughs> so you actually have three or more layers. You put them together, and you use them as a wall, which is actually... Uh, directly changeable to a concrete wall, you would say. And you can, might have this. You know, you've seen one of the slides of the sky from Michael Green uh, architect systems. We are trying to get more and more introduced this product on the market. And Central Europe is using it a lot. And it's getting in North America on the market. And why not using poplar for that? Today we don't doing it, but we could. You have this massive wood. We don't have this in Europe, but I wanted to include it because it has been used... Uh, quite a while ago, and I think half a century ago, it was quite popular in the U.S. to use this kind of approaches on massive timber materials. So it's actually not a new invention. It's something that was around and pops up now because we think that wood might be a very good construction material, even with this kind of production methods behind it. So yes, and how much is that now? Um, so in, in Glulam, we have quite considerable numbers, and Europe might be still a little bit higher in, in North America. I'm not sure about all the figures, whether they're guesstimates or even just estimates. Eh? Um, but the production of GLT or Glulam is quite considerable, and this several millions of cubic meters of products which are actually fully designed for load-bearing applications is quite important. Today, we have more than half a million cubic meters of cross-laminated timber already on the market every year, uh, which means that we might have that product uh, far more, and it might be one of the options. Where should I point at that one? OK, what is then possible? Um, Poplar has been assessed like that. It has been used in France, but still softwoods are sometimes cheaper, easier, easier to grade. And it is an alternative for producing glula, but especially the interest in CLT might be one that uh, comes up far more. And consider that I put the word Aspen also in the title. 
because we're using spruce, not necessarily the highest quality to produce CLT, but because of the technology and the engineered aspect to it, we can start from quite light material to get to quite good products. Okay, that was sawn wood. So I'm getting smaller and smaller. I'm getting to veneer now. Veneer as one of the veneer-based products. Uh, packaging, as I said, it should not only be chocolate from Belgium, but it's also different other materials. And actually, you could also consider matches from the past. And a lot of fruit and vegetable boxes and things like that. And remind you also that the fact that Poplar has now been reinvented a little bit, especially in France, as being the casing of the box for Camembert. And it has been very popular to replant now forest with poplar because of that publicity on the French television. So that kind of things work. Um, uh, veneer. Uh, it's a lot less veneer production in the world compared to sawn wood, but it's considered as being a higher quality material with a specific possibility to replace man-made materials like plastics and metals and things like that. So it's not only in the construction world, also in the packaging world, we still have to win some elements. Um, the match production industry is, is a segment, but especially fruit of boxes. And rotary cut veneers are used, like in Italy, to reconstitute very nice wood species. I'm not quite sure if you know what that means, but you actually put veneers together, you cut them in a special angle, and you recreate wood from poplar. This is some of the products, um, plywood, LVL, laminated veneer lumber. Um, they're not necessarily related to what I was earlier saying on veneer, but they're based on veneer. So uh, you see some pictures of products that are already based on plywood or similar products. Uh, this is not all poplar, this is in general, but you see some even poplar with some beach on top of it, uh, which was a product that was very popular in, in Belgium. Popular, popular. <sighs> so yes, because we are playing with the density. Poplar has the advantage of being low density. And everything should not be heavy nowadays. It should be strong, but not necessarily heavy. That is one of the advantages using this kind of material, also for spruce, but especially for poplar, this is also a file. So yes, you know that uh, plywood is produced by cross and LVL, normally by parallel veneer systems, especially designed to make beams out of it and to use it as a construction material. Uh, most people should be aware of that. Uh, we Europeans only have one plant, and we don't use it for poplar or for something like that, but we could do it. Uh, plywood production in the world is a lot bigger of what I was discussing on veneer, and it's important. Uh, probably don't forget it, but there's a lot of plywood produced in Asia. Uh, somebody know what country is involved in that? You should be guessing, and you can tell me later. Uh, OK, plywood. Um, poplar is very well suited for production of veneer and plywood. Uh, but you need high quality locks, cylindrical locks. So what we, my group has been doing in interacting with selection and breeding is actually looking for trees that are straight, that are round, and that have lot of, not a lot of taper. And that's what we call tree quality. It's not even considering what is inside, but it's already one of the parameters. So especially for this kind of productions. We do see that uh, poplar plywood um, has declined over here, or whatever you have considered in the end. and, and Plywood in general has not been a very important product. It is still important, but not anymore as important as it was earlier. Because of OSB has been very critical. But I've shown at least some of the elements that, especially China, but also Europe, is taking popular plywood industry as a new thriving option. Um, Larger production of poplar plywood in Europe is like this company, which is not, I mean, we're not talking about small amounts. This is in Spain and some in France also, of close to 300,000 cubic meters per year, just poplar plywood. And there is some sent to North America of that. Some of the products that you might see that is perforated and uh, music-related instruments, lightweight products that are white are more and more getting some of the attention of the general public. Uh, what is then the volumes produced? Um, LVL uh, is, is not necessarily very high, but it's uh, considered as a very important product. And I can announce or include that a company, Polmeyer, is using beach for LVL production. And you might wonder, why they're not popular? They have been thinking about it, but they are located in Germany. And they don't have a lot of resources over there on popular that is of quality. But beach LVL is too heavy, actually to be well-performing. Okay. 
Finally, I have to come to even smaller elements. And um, I might say, what word should you use? Particle-based products. And you call that particle board in English, and then you put it together as chipboard and OSB. Is that correct? I think it is. Um, but uh, we use particle board as a synonym for chipboard. So if you get statistics, they might be strange, might be different. But anyhow, we have products that are not really relying on veneer and less relying on the quality of the tree and probably possible to be produced based on recovered wood in the cascade use system. We Europeans are winners on that one, right? Are you aware of that? I mean, while you're using wood-based panels over here on different, but we're using this um, not high-quality stuff a lot. And we use it even in construction, imagine. Yeah. Yes, we can use poplars and willows and, and, and aspen for that. Um, it's good bonding characteristics. There's some compressibility. You can actually get it very well. There's some impact of tension wood, mating in with the processing, but you can overcome that. I know that Aspen OSB is a very important product over here. We don't have it. So there's some opportunities, even for us, to learn from over here. Yeah, good. So the production of quality hybrid poplar-based uh, OSB um, is confirmed. And, and actually, with Willow, we can also do that. So why are we not trying to do that? And, and there has been attempts to uh, get plants in, in Hungary and things like that. But as, at this moment, I said there was none. There is a new production in Italy starting OSB production from the Banzano Industries. Finally, actually, when I was introducing engineered wood products, you were probably getting a little bit in this direction, of saying that the fancy special ones based on strands and, and laminated strand lumber and oriented strand lumber and these things, um, which are very common over here, but we Europeans, although we have hybrid poplar, seems not to be interested in this material by now. So I just want to refer that it's not just a very common similar thing we do. We might have interest also in this kind of products and getting that even parallel strand lumber as a production system based on veneer-based or non-veneer-based uh, flake-based materials. Um, this is since long in presence in North America, isn't it? You know it very well. We only discovered it a few years ago. We're trying to sell it. We are hardly, hardly producing it. But this is creating opportunities also for lightweight softwoods, as well as for our poplars. And we are clearly looking into options to get these materials also on the market. But you have the products too. And you're probably not necessarily basing it on uh, Aspen or on something. So yes, uh, there is a proportion. Uh, that is not as high as LVL production, and, and there is uh, a lot of I-beams in North America, and I tell you the story that we should do it, probably do it better in the end. And in totally, when we're looking at poplar, we have the same opportunities as with solid wood. We might have even better opportunities if we have this fantastic round materials produced consistently for producing veneer, which with softwood is sometimes difficult to get that really in a one-to-one -one system. Fast-growing aspen or poplar might be a very good resource for LSL and uh, get some examples of how you get OSB and LVL both on this kind of basis for iJoy systems. And finally, it comes to the tiniest particle, not even a particle, a fiber, or something very much like that, which could be fiberboard. I wrote it correctly in the North American way here. Both, uh, we, in, we distinguish, of course, hardboards, MDF, and insulation boards, and there's different figures there. But there's a considerable amount of MDF, or even HDF, or how you call it, produced for different applications, but also a lot of it is produced uh, in Europe, not as much as in Asia, but uh, also reflecting on the fact that we use that for flooring and for different furniture-like products. And we know that poplar and willows would be suitable for that because it's suitable for pulping, it's suitable for these products, right? And that we could have more and that we could have uh, pulpwood production similar to what you have experienced over the last, I could call it even centuries, surely decades, and, and last year's probably a little bit less, and let's say like that. But it is uh, something that you have at least uh, experience with and consider that as a part of your industry. While in Europe, 
Uh, even the Scandinavian production of pulp and paper is hardly using aspen or hard, is only using somewhat other materials. So we could do better on this one, but then probably we have to think about this integrated story we started with. So we're using it for plywood, LVL, OSB, but also for pulping. And we probably would also have to consider uh, this one. Eh? Um, so we actually not necessarily thinking about standard products. And I myself neglected for long this kind of products when they were not using just wood and glue. But wood and cement is a quite important product, both in Asia, Europe, and probably some of it is also over here present and not so common. But it's, it's a growing market and it's expected to grow with 4% per year in the coming years, which is not necessarily very low. And it uses one fourth or quarter of it is wood. And it's estimated somewhere about 26 million tons of products on the world scale every year. Poplar would be very suitable for that. Some researchers are looking for specific opportunities of poplar for this purpose. And then this one, very familiar in North America. And the first story I got in my lab on that, they would use recycled plastics and combine it with recovered wood and then get to a fantastic product. I still have to find the first plant that is actually doing that. Most of them are using virgin fiber, virgin material, also, and virgin plastics. But it was a good story, wasn't it? So especially over here, you, you use it as an alternative for treated materials sometimes. In Europe, we tend to replace some tropical which species we use in outdoor applications also by this product. And they're not overwhelming, fantastic in all senses, but they have a part of the market and they are consistent and they are there. And they have some quality to it. But they are using 50% uh, wood and there's a lot of production. And actually, it could be that with some of the non very readily usable material from poplars and aspen could also introduce in that as a direct product. Today, we are using in Belgium and France mostly spruce origin for that from the sawmills. OK, and I feed stuff. Finally, I want to say something more, which is not necessarily engineered wood, but it's just about treated wood products. And this will lead me to the final elements that I would say, although poplar is not the best material, we can sometimes make something better out of it. And on the left side of this slide, you would see some story about wood protection or wood preservation, which means that you want to increase the surface life of a product based on poplar by adding components to make it lasting longer. And this is a balance between uh, material resistance. A poplar is not durable. So you could use a tropical wood species to replace it, and you would definitely get a good story. But we don't do that. And on the other hand, you can discuss your moisture risk. You can say whether it's dry or wet. And, and then I would say that even this climate you have outside here is fantastic because that is a very dry climate, isn't it? It's very cold. Fungi do not grow at these temperatures. So wood is not rotting in Alberta now. In my country, it's sometimes, it's, today it's also cold, but most of the time it is above zero and it's raining a lot. So we get a lot of moisture, we get that issues a lot more. So we go there. On the right-hand side, I want to refer to something we did in 2003 already, where we Imagine that uh, we were creating a network, a first network on wood modification, on changing the properties of wood by doing, really changing the chemical background of the material and making it not necessarily more durable, but more stable, more better for using outside. And I want to guide you a little bit through these two aspects as being opportunities, especially designed also for poplar next to other non-durable materials. Okay was said earlier, thank you for that, that there was a conference every year, and last year it was in Ghent, dedicated to the International Research Group on Wood Protection. I'm president of the organization, and I'm lucky I can go somewhere end of April, beginning of May to Johannesburg. And the year after, I'll be in Quebec City. And you kindly invited, if you want, as a Canadian citizen, to come over there and join that group. We're going to talk on wood preservation. But although it is entitled wood preservation, it's about wood protection. And they also talk about modified wood, all different mechanisms, coatings, and elements about having the material long lasting. Especially for poplar, this has not been discussed a lot, but it's an option. 
to work from low durability, not very stable material, to something very qualified. Um, wood preservation is simpler, isn't it? You, you, you pump liquids into wood and you make that the biocides or the components stay there and then afterwards the fungi or the insects cannot eat them. That's it. We have in the past been focusing on what they call use class four. We're putting sticks in the ground and look whether they last and we kick against it and we don't look whether it's good. Uh, we have mm, using biocides and that's a tricky word. And uh, We've been using chemistry and uh, not everybody in the room is fantastic, enthusiastic about these things, isn't it? I mean, pesticides and all this stuff. It's still part of the story and it's part of the game. We're going to have to be realistic. Either we are using wood species that last long or we're treating wood species that are not lasting long to last longer. And that's just a story. And how we do it, we might use biocides of different things. When I started my job, we were using uh, copper, chromium, arsenic. Today, we are hardly using that. And I've been invited also to discuss with, with companies like Janssen, like Johnson Johnson, the company now, uh, on new pesticides. And today, we're using no longer the biocide. We're using actually the same against fungi on my skin to make preservation in wood. And still, we are doubting whether that is good. I'm not, nobody's worried about this, isn't it? Okay. Just, give, just showing you some slides, I was starting with this wood industry companies, and now I'm getting to different ones. And one by one, they are chemical industry, producing components that we can use in the wood industry. And we are treating the wood with chemistry. So that means that even in that conference, we have a, have a good understanding and a good relationship with people that normally are not into renewable resources, into our appreciation of forestry. And this is not always a simple job, because they are having different goals and different ways of getting money out of it. I would also want to stress something on wood modification, and I'm deeply involved in that stuff. And, um, to the end of this year, we will have a conference in, or it's not the end of this year, it's September already, um, I'm thinking to, uh, in the Netherlands. And that's already the ninth time I first show you the first, the first one in 2003, the ninth conference. And there will be over 200 attendees just discussing for at least two days wood modification. This is becoming big in Europe not as big as wood preservation, but it is becoming big. And we have dedicated, and, and I want just to illustrate, this is European system where we have what we call collaborative networking on specific thematics. There are 33 countries, and I think it are 33 countries, are joining every six months researchers on this thematic with money from Europe. And we're doing different, but Europe is supporting this stuff because we want to go beyond biocides and we want to increase the properties of low quality wood species. Poplar, aspen. This is an of wood modification possibility. There are brand names. There's something called new wood species. Uh, it's not necessarily about durability. It's about surface life. It's definitely about dimension stability and weathering performance. You see some of the pilot plants or acetylation here, and you see some IUs which has been thermally treated for cladding. I'm just now questioning who knows what I use is. Triplochiton cleroxylon, a very common tropical wood species. See how we evolve. Wood species that are not very common and not very durable, we're starting to treat them with modification to become cladding products over at our place. It's not huge, but it's starting to come this kind of new methods of getting to it. You have different methods. I'm talking about thermally modified timber. I'm not going into detail, but at least you're heating up under a non-oxygen atmosphere up to temperatures of 200 and more degrees centigrade. And by that, you're changing the material, and you see uh, slightly modified to the right to very heavily modified to the left. There's chemical modification using acetic anhydride or furfuryl alcohol. There's a bridge in, in the Netherlands. There are different products based on radiator pine coming from New Zealand. And also the Norway production of cabinet is illustrated by something. Other. And there's also others using hydrophobase. Uh, Non-biocidal systems, right? Chemistry, yes. Still some question. Focus on use class three, so not in ground contact 
but out of ground contact. And that's why it's probably not always very successful over here, because people think that you should be able to put it in the ground to be sure that it's not rotting. But if you lift it out of the ground, there's less organisms that do their job. And you can manage surface life a lot better. What industry involved? I think none of these have should been shown earlier. Right? There might be some duplicates somewhere, but they're not very logic. And so there are different companies producing this stuff, different worlds doing. So we have to bring them together to discuss the topic of popper or not. And yes, pressure treatments uh, is very important in, in uh, over the world, and especially North America has been contributing a lot. Uh, in Europe, we are minor compared to that, but we're still playing a role by having over six million cubic meters per year treated under pressure treatment uh, for having their biocides introduced and getting to longer surface lives. It's considerable. While on the other hand, this wood modification stuff, fantastic, isn't it? Because it's a little bit expensive, takes special technology. We only at this moment probably were closer to 300,000 cubic meters in total, which is a majority is still thermally modification. Is this a lot? Probably not, but I've shown you the products. They're so specific, this might be a step forward for using that. And can we do this for poplar? Yeah. Poplar and aspen are unfortunately not just easy to treat. They do have refractory aspects to it, so there's some issues. So it actually, preservative treatments do not always work. Um, we have been considering the fact that plywood might be used, poplar plywood, for exterior applications. It's a crazy question, isn't it? But it works. Depends on what is the surf life space and how you expose it. Especially when you combine it with species like Okume, you get to fantastic products. And finally, we have a state-of-the-art product on the market yet that is poplar that is thermally modified. And this product is used for cladding alongside different products. And capital modification is probably on its way. Uh, even investments that are now on fiber treatments might also change the world. Just some examples of one of my colleagues. Uh, um, thermally modified poplar used in combination with other material for window frames and the full cladding of thermally modified poplar on a house or a building in the Netherlands, which is using black cladding boating systems, but still it is poplar that has been thermally modified to stabilize it and to be used as cladding system. With this, I had one slide more which is thanking you for your attention. Well, thank you very much for a, a very interesting global presentation on both products and opportunities. Um, I'd like to open up the floor uh, to questions and invite you to go to the middle of the room, please, to ask your questions of uh, Joris, and I'm sure you're willing to entertain them. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's just easier for everybody else if, if you can go to this uh, mic, please. You talked about vertical integration. Um, you, you also talk about things like thermal modification, um, acetylization, and uh, treated wood products. You noticed that you noted that the treated wood using um, uh, arsenic and copper compounds is decreasing. But uh, one thing I'd like you to address is how that changes the vertical integration issue. Because if you have stuff that's been highly chemically modified, is it any longer suitable for use uh, as a fuel? Uh, or is there a danger in uh, using it for other purposes? It's not a simple thing to answer to that one. But um, allow me to say that um, when you're treating wood with uh, copper, chromium, and arsenic, uh, there might be some questions on whether you can reuse it or put it somewhere at stake. I can go to some other, um, what to say, high performance of heavy duty wood preservatives like creosote, and it has been questioned whether you could reuse it or not. And, and in the Belgian, we've been reusing it for gardening even, putting as fencing systems or for agriculture. In Germany, it was forbidden. So they were sending all their railway sleepers to Sweden to burn them in incinerator for producing electricity. 
I'm not going to avoid your question. I just want to put the picture a little bit. Um, when you're talking about using today's biocides, it's sometimes a little bit weird for me to say that we should exclude them from reuse, for me, because we are using a lot of wood species that also contain biocides uh, as such, and we have no issues on using that, as long as these biocides are not necessarily dangerous or difficult in the concentration. So actually some of the tabletops in some tropical wood species on furniture are dangerous. And I explained some wood species you should not use when you're naked. <laughs> it's just like that. But of course, if you know it, you don't do it. But that brings me, not that I want to ridiculize the system, but it ought to put in perspective. It's true. And so I'm not saying that you should reuse it for any application, but if you re reuse it like for a cement board for outdoor applications, the Japanese market has been very successful in integrating CCA-treated wood in that kind of products. And not necessarily negative, but cement is not a fantastic product itself. Adding a little bit of chemistry, which is not, is not sad thematic. Okay, that's putting it up. But if you go to these modification steps, when you're using like acetylation, acetic anhydride, or you're using furfalyl alcohol, you're adding actually components that are already present in wood. You're not creating something chemically different and biocidal issues on these topics. When you're terminally treating, you're actually reassessing the aldehyde and, and, and different components and modifying some of the hemicellulose structure into something that is not that different from some other materials, only it's uh, more resistance to decay and have a different equilibrium moisture content and in this way will not be destroyed by fungi or sometimes even not by insects. These products are viable to be reused in a cascade vertical integration system. That's actually why uh, quite some major industry in Europe that is in this vertical industry, like Storaens or OPM Cumina, which uh, they own forests, they have sawmills, they have pulp mills, they have plywood mills, and they have all this stuff, but they also use nowadays thermal treatments. And they are interested in integrating also with chemical modification because they know that this part of the integrated approach. So they can select the material specifically for the use of that. Today, it's sometimes difficult to use acetylation because none of our European and none of the uh, major Canadian wood species are very suitable for impregnation with these chemicals because if it's an imbalance, you will have a distortion of your material. So actually only southern yellow pines from the US have been attempted by some people to be used in that respect. So that makes it difficult to put it in an integrated approach, but it's possible. Especially thermal treatment is very much possible. Even as I've shown, I've shown only an example of Ayus, but I could also show the use of Frake in Limba, different wood species from the tropics, lightweight, easy to treat, thermally modified, integrated approach of getting them into the market. Yeah. Is that always readily done today? No, but it is something that is growing. Yeah, yeah. it's a good story, isn't it? I try to bring the good stories. Yeah. Have we got any more questions from the floor? I know there's lots of students here today, and we have lots of companies that work with Aspen. If nobody's going to do it, I will. Um, uh, bef before you started your talk, you mentioned that the New Zealand was growing poplars partially as, cat as cattle fodder and then something else. Uh, I'm really curious about that one because of the film that I, I saw uh, uh, made here in Canada about 20 years ago. So I wonder if you could expound on that a little bit. Yeah, I'm sorry I'm not a specialist on cattle fodder, but anyhow. Um, but that, uh, if we were referring to the word integrated, uh, we will have to cope with uh, poplar plantations will be multifunctional. And they will be part of biodiversity. They will be part of, they are today. I mean, if I would show a plantation in, in Argentina or I show you one in Belgium, uh, the one in Belgium would not look like a plantation because there will be all different trees and different parts in the story. Uh, the other one from Argentina might be a lot like agriculture, but still we are having the same approaches. If we use it for something linked to farming, 
It could be in the production system, but it could also be that we're using part of the trees uh, in that respect. And especially in New Zealand, when there's uh, periods where little or not enough grass or other fodder is present, they can be used as an extra complementary material for having the cattle to, to feed on it uh, for a while. Yes, And it's a, an option. I mean, we've been using willows for coppicing uh, for very long. It's part of the Flemish landscape. So we, we have coppice material. Why did we coppice uh, willows? Because if it becomes trees, they become owned by the landowner. And if they coppice, they are property of the farmer. There's always some tradition that we should follow. But we can use that material for partly fodder. Yes, definitely. It's in many tropical countries also leaves and, and seeds are used to, to uh, have meat production, like with rabbits and things like that. Yeah. It's part of the development and of, um, yeah. But I'm not a specialist, although I'm linked to that. Yeah. Nick? One of the issues with uh, poppers in Canada, particularly in the aspen, is there's a lot of, a lot of disease and discoloration of the wood from, um, from the, in, the, in the bowl of the tree. Yeah. Um, does this make much difference to, uh, I can see if the wood is completely consumed, it's, it's, it's unusable, but would, would issues such as uh, discoloration and partial, partial uh, colonization by fungi have a big impact on, mm. on using solid woods? Because that's probably the, a primary reason for the slow uptake yeah. of, uh, of sawn wood in, in uh, Aspen, mm. from my understanding. Yeah, I could, could refer to some expression in Swedish in saying when wood is rotten, it's utskot. That means it's no use. That means the presence of fungi in wood will very fast degrade the mechanical properties. And it should not even be losing mass before it's already losing strength. Uh, it is a real issue. And, and uh, grading for being non-infected is a very good thing to do when you're envisaging mechanical properties. Having said that, if you're producing things like plywood and your interior plies would contain big holes because of branches were or things like that, you can still produce a fairly good product. And it's not necessarily that it has to be fantastic mechanical properties. It might be necessary to have that kind of material on the outside of your plywood because that is actually where your mechanical properties are defined most. So you can actually get around that if you do clever uh, processing uh, selection systems. But I understand that it's not only specific for something very easy to destroy by fungi like poplar, but also for many softwoods. This is the case when they are attacked by some fungi in the forest. We sometimes are blind for what is happening, but an actual situation is that this material is very much lower in mechanical properties than it was originally planned for. But we still use it. And up to now, we have no major issues on that. But if you are clever in processing, we can still process wood. But it is a story, yeah, definitely. And you cannot sort it out by wood modification or by these things. That's not done. And it's even if you go to pulping, it will give you negative figures, definitely. Yeah. Any more questions? I have one about uh, rotation age. So if you're planting a hybrid poplar uh, plantation, what would be, do you feel, the optimum rotation age or size that you would target to get the maximum use out of it? Yeah. Well, well, I gave to the students this morning some explanation on the Spanish example. They're using for garnica, where they use plywood, is 300,000 cubic meters every year. They use a 15 years rotation period and they're planting uh, less than six meters apart. Yeah. So this is actually a very viable technique. In Belgium, we still tend to use nine by nine plantations or even 10 by 10 and having different trees in between so that the poplars are in the plantation, but they're actually not very visible. It looks like a semi-natural stand, uh, something like that. And, and people do not necessarily recognize it as a plantation. And, and it's always, uh, if, if you put these categories, they're not exact categories. You can actually get around that by some clever engineering of your plantation. And people are uh, actually into using poplars for not reclamation could be, but at least for 
afforestation for arable land, and you put the poplars, it creates a climate for coming trees of the future, and you get the poplars as a biennial species first, and after 25 years, like this rotation in my country, you cut them, and what remains is some oak, some beech, some, uh, and, and that goes into uh, ecological approach of new forest creation. It's not done on very large scale because we don't have large scale forestry in Belgium, but at least there are some people that taking that initiative, and there's very good things to use poplar, you have a production, but we have also the people taking the product. So we have a guarantee that your product is sold in the end, which is not always the case when some this industry is not present or is present in this way. Yeah. So you have the equipment to handle going into those stands and just taking out one crop at a time? That's sometimes uh, the people doing the forest exploitation, they are not very pleased with that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can't say that, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> but sometimes they cut, um, they coppice the material first and they go for the poplar and the coppice comes back and they leave some oaks and some elements in the forest for having the future. So there are ways around it, um, yeah. but you have to get your equipment in the, in the plantation, I understand that, yeah. One final question from the floor? This is not what you ask it, but nobody was going to ask the <laughs> final question. <laughs> all right, well, thank you so much for a okay, wonderful you. presentation. If you all please join me in thanking Mr. Van Acker. Thank you. Uh, before we uh, finish up this afternoon, oh, I guess I don't need two speakers. Here, I'll give you yeah, that one. <laughs> I, I've invited up uh, Guillermo Ramirez, who is going to be presenting the awards from the poster competition this afternoon. So if you didn't know, the posters were actually being judged, and there are winners from this afternoon. So. Thank you, Barb. I'm very privileged to work with the graduate student in our department so that we can generate these nice poster presentations and showcasing the variety of research going on across the department. And it's a great experience also for them to be able to exchange ideas and be able to practice their communication skills and improving along the way. So it's a great exercise. And I can see that several of the students are in the public today, right? So and just to recognize the participation of everyone, I would like to ask for a round of applause for all of them to encourage that participation. It's great. So we have uh, three awards. But also I would like to thank very much the judge. They were uh, uh, very uh, dedicated and committed to be able to do the best, right? But it was very challenging because of the quality of the presentations. And they are also some of them around. And I appreciate very much the, the participation that helped to be able to do this peer review evaluation to the poster presentations. So we have three envelopes. Um, the instructions, uh, there are several instructions inside the envelope. Uh, it's $50, $50 in cash. Uh, the cash is not inside the envelope, right? But, but the instructions are inside, so you just follow those instructions and you will be able to get uh, from the main office, uh, Christy Nohos will be able to deliver those. So it's great. So we, have, uh, we, we were able to, to find out uh, this uh, uh, awards uh, and through this uh, evaluation. And I would like to call uh, the, the three names of the students. Uh, I hope we can catch some of them around the room and they can just come and get their, their, their awards or I can deliver them to them later. So we have three names here. So just come uh, along and get your award, please. Um, Sarah Thatcher. Is it Sarah Thatcher? Yeah, that's it. Just being, uh, please come along. So we have also Daniel uh, Daniel Green Acre. Yes, please come. Oh, you can. You can you? Yes, <laughs> and we have also Mark Lafresh. Is it Mark around? Oh, there he is. Oh, wait, we have all three. That's great. So please come. So, Sarah? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for thank your presentation. You. Great poster presentations. You. So the poster is still on, right? So if you are curious and you'd like to take a look, the, you can just go across the cafeteria and, and be able to enjoy those uh, posters and presentations and, and be able to support our students that way. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thanks very much, Guillermo. That was wonderful, and it was a great display of uh, posters. So yes, they are being kept up for a little bit longer, another half hour or so. So if folks who were here rushed to get to the lecture weren't able to see them, uh, you have time to pop over there. So once again, I would like to thank all of you for coming today. Very much appreciate uh, you coming and spending your afternoon with us here and uh, coming and listening to our speaker all the way from Europe. It's been wonderful having yours here. Uh, we've known each other for many years uh, at Poplar meetings around the world, so it's, it's great to be able to host him here in Edmonton. Uh, also would like to thank the sponsors again for your uh, ongoing uh, support of this lecture series. And drawing this to a close, I know many of you are coming to the faculty club for dinner as part of the sponsor dinner, so look forward to spending the evening there with you. And I think most of you know it's straight up the road. <laughs> And uh, Mixer starts at 5.15, so enjoy a little bit more of the poster session, and we will see you up at the faculty club. And the next fills, <laughs> thank you, will be on November 1st uh, in the fall, 2018. We do not have the speaker finalized yet for that, and hopefully very soon we'll be able to announce both the fall and the next spring speaker as well. So we're looking at somebody uh, with expertise in silviculture for our next uh, speaker, but I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. So thank you all again for coming. Have a nice evening. Thank you.